Okay, I think we're going to start. Thank you very much for joining us on this evening with David Rauch, a partner at Freshfields, who is going to be speaking about his book, The Social License. And I'm just going to introduce briefly the speaker and then my colleague, Dr. Costan Farruso, will introduce further the evening and the theme that we will be discussing this evening. Let me start by saying thanks to David for joining us and also to say that this is a joint event of the Institute of Banking and Finance, where I am the director and Katrien Morbe, who is also with us, is the deputy director, and a joint event with the Institute of Regulation and Ethics, where my colleague and friend, Dr. Costanza Russo, is the director. And we are delighted that the students from banking and finance, as well as commercial and law generally, are joining us this evening. David is widely recognized in our field, in the field of financial law and regulation, for his expertise, and he works on a range of financial market participants on both advisory and transactional matters, and obviously he's an expert on financial regulation, which is one of the key subjects in his book, The Social License for Financial Markets, Reaching for the End and Why It Counts, a book that has been published by Palgrave, Palgrave in July 2020, and which is available widely. And uh, David has consulted for, for the firm, for Pressfields, where he works, and he's actually going very kindly to offer to us another evening together with his colleagues in the spring term to talk about the opportunities of Fresh Deals as an international legal firm. But today he's going to talk about his book. And uh, let me just say before I give the word to my colleague, Ostanza, that it's interesting that in addition to the classic stuff that he would do as a financial lawyer and financial regulatory lawyer, such as the interface between conduct and competition, and assisting clients with Brexit, a word that I don't want to talk very much this evening because I want it to be a happy evening and that's not a word that brings any happiness these days. But I was going to say that he's currently advising the United Nations Environment Programme and others on the integration of sustainability in the investment chain. A very important issue and I know that some of you are planning to write essays or dissertations on that subject. And he's also known and that's why he's talking today for his work on law and institutional culture and has helped a number of firms as well as other universities in this endeavor. He's a regular commentator on financial service related matters. And in addition to his book, of which he will be speaking tonight, he has also contributed to the Journal of International Banking, Law and Regulation and The Times. Uh, I will now pass the word to my colleague, Dr. Costanza Russo, and uh, before David starts, I will also say that the questions you can ask at the end, you can write in the chat room and uh, Catherine will keep a, a track of them, but you can also raise your hand. This is supposed to be an interactive evening and that's why we did it via Zoom. So Constanza, the floor is yours and thank you very much, David, for being with us today. I will mute myself so that there is no less noise in the back. Thank you, Rosa. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my special thanks go to start with to um, David for being uh, here. I will say a few words of how um, David and I have, have known each other for quite some time, actually. I was trying to think of how many years, and then I think after five, I just stopped. I said, okay, five is long enough, but actually it's way longer. Uh, let me thank also uh, Rosa as a director of the um, Institute of Banking and Finance for um, organizing this, uh, this joint event and to our wonderful student uh, rep, uh, Saski, who has put really all uh, the, the logistic efforts behind this. So um, uh, why do I want to tell you um, why I know, I know David is because it's, it is really testament to how many years and how much effort he has put behind the study of, uh, of, of an area that at the time when he started, and I, if I may say when we started somehow together, was completely unknown. So I started off by studying ethics in finance, and already people were thinking it was an oxymoron. But then I would say that David brought it to the next level by introducing the idea of social license that 
even I was like, yeah, I understand what you mean, but actually, how are you going to explain it and how are you going to study this? And we started off with a research project, um, the Law and Ethics in Finance project that involved also senior members of the uh, of the judiciary, uh, among which um, a professor now, uh, William Blair. Uh, and then I worked with him with the St. Paul Institute. Uh, we did something together there and uh, with the and also with the with the Bank of England. And you know, in a sense, in a selfish way, I was like, I think he's saying something extremely interesting, extremely valuable, something that no one understands apart from some very eminent moral philosophers in this country. So why don't I kind of force to put all of this in writing? And and this is when he very, very kindly agreed to write a chapter for a book that Professor Lastra, myself and Professor Blair have, uh, have edited. And again, the, the success of that book is really due to the contributors, and um, among which, as I said, uh, David. Uh, and this is where I, I started to understand the um, what, he, what he's trying to, to explain. Of course, I'm not going to spoil you, uh, to spoil anything. But if I may, I would like to reference to something that uh, Michael Sandel has, has said about, has written about the book when he said that David Rauch shows that public trust in finance cannot be established by laws and regulation alone. His call for a social license for finance should inspire much needed public debate about the role of finance in a just uh, society. And I, you know, I cannot second those, uh, those words any, any more, any uh, better. And also I would refer to what the then governor of the Bank of England said about this, uh, when he talked about the ethical drift that um, we had in financial markets a few years ago, uh, against which the Fair and Effective Markets Review, I don't know if um, you have heard of it, uh, had been set up. So really, this is just to, to say how much we, we are all privileged to have the occasion to, to listen to, to David live, let's say, <laughs> this new communication means. But um, so really to thank him, to thank all of you for being here. And without any further ado, I will leave the floor to David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexander. Um, and, and thank you for those very generous and, uh, and, and warm introductions. It's a, a great pleasure to be joining you this evening. Um, now, I don't know if you've come across a series of children's puzzle books called Where's Wally? Or if you come from the United States, Where's Waldo? Um, they consist of a series of detailed double page spread illustrations of lots of people doing a variety of amusing things uh, at a given location. And the challenge, uh, should you choose to accept it, uh, is to find a character named Wally hidden in the group. Now, whatever the situation being depicted, he's always there, identified by his characteristic red and white striped shirt, bobble hat uh, and glasses. Well, now I'm thinking of patenting my own version for grown-ups called Where's Milton? The Milton in question is Milton Friedman. Back in the 1970s and 80s, Milton Friedman was revered as the high priest of neoliberal economics. More recently, however, uh, he has been popping up all over the place as its chief whipping boy in discussions about the future of business. And an article he wrote in September 1970 for the New York Times magazine has been singled out for particular attention. And indeed, one phrase is now quoted so regularly that it's getting distinctly threadbare. And let me quote it again and add to the process. The duty of company directors, he said, is to conduct business in accordance with the shareholders' desires, which will generally be to generate as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and in ethical custom. Now, uh, 
you will immediately recognise that that is not especially distinguished as a piece of legal analysis. Indeed, from an English law perspective, it's just wrong. Um, however, it does conveniently represent a view of the business world, uh, you can call it the shareholder value model, that is currently disintegrating before our eyes as attention is increasingly drawn beyond financial returns to focus on the impact of business activity on the social and natural environment. We're seeing a profound reevaluation of the purpose of business. What valued ends we want business to achieve. Businesses and financial firms are currently struggling to pick their way through that process. And my, uh, my book is intended to help them with that. And significantly, uh, the kernel of what I'm saying is actually picked up by Milton Friedman, almost subconsciously and certainly left undeveloped in the passage I've just quoted. For in referring to the basic rules of society, Friedman almost couldn't help himself from acknowledging that the business world relies on uh, and can nourish, but can also damage the quality of its relationship with wider society. What in my book I've referred to in the context of financial markets as its social license. So uh, with that introduction uh, finished, in the next few minutes, I want to answer three questions. Where are we now? What, what is this re-evaluation that I've just been talking about? And what issues is it presenting for us? Second, what is the social license for financial markets? And third, why can recognising that it's there make a difference? So where are we now? What's the social license? And how can it make a difference? And before I uh, dive into that in, in time honoured fashion, I should just mention that the comments I'm about to make are made in a personal capacity and, and don't necessarily represent the views of Freshfields. So kicking off, where are we now? I wrote this book because it's clear to me that we need fundamental behaviour change in financial markets. First, so that finance operators are more focused on solving problems that really count. And secondly, to heal the current rift between finance and wider society. So let's look at each of those two things in a little bit more detail. As to the first, it's obvious that humanity is facing some of the toughest and most complex challenges it's ever had to deal with. Climate change is perhaps the most pressing, but there are many, many others. Uh, not least the increasingly visible economic trauma from uh, COVID-19. Now, financial markets have the power to provide solutions to many of those challenges, not all of them, but to many of them. But for them to do that, we need them working sustainably and well. Now, they already do that, of course, up to a point, and it really is essential not to lose sight of that. However, much more is needed. Uh, and that is essentially the same, recognising that more is needed, is essentially the same as saying that we need behaviour change. As to the second area where behaviour change is needed, that rift between finance and wider society, the ability of finance to provide solutions is partly dependent on a relationship of trust between finance operators and the wider societies in which they operate. Now, at the moment, that relationship clearly remains fractured. The shadow of the financial crisis is surprisingly long, and fairly or not, the finance sector is regarded as having done massive damage to our societies, uh, and that has resulted in a major loss of trust in finance. Addressing that requires behaviour change, so that behaviour in financial markets provides a basis for justified trust, justified trust, trust that will not turn out to be misplaced. 
Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, recognised this uh, back in 2015 when he first mentioned the social licence financial markets. And he, he did indeed kindly provide the foreword to this book because he understands that fundamental behavioural change is needed if we're going to get markets achieving their fullest potential and working for everyone. Essentially, the behaviour change that is needed is for behaviour somehow to become more other regarding. In other words, more focused on addressing the needs of those outside finance, not just the needs of finance operators, and providing a basis for others justified trust. How do you influence that behaviour? We've got a big problem, we've got a behavioural problem, but how do you go about influencing it? Well, going back to Milton Friedman and that, and that quote, the knee-jerk response of many people to that question when asked is that it's all about new rules. Remember that Friedman talked about conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and in ethical custom. So people often say it's about introducing the right laws and making sure people adhere to ethical standards. And up to a point, they're right. Certainly those of us who are lawyers could be expected to agree with that. But there's a problem. Neither the barrage of regulations in recent years, nor lots of discussion about ethics uh, among senior bankers since the financial crisis, or multiple revised codes of ethics has, have so far brought about the sort of step change that is needed. So I started uh, life at Freshfields um, uh, not that long after the Big Bang of the 1980s, and I, I've seen financial sector regulation grow exponentially uh, over the time I've been there. Um, and that regulation did not stop the financial crisis. And in spite of a wave of further regulation since then, it hasn't resolved the issues that I've just been describing. New regulation has done something. So, for example, it helps to ensure that banks uh, didn't fall over in the face of COVID-19. But it hasn't healed the relational fracture. And nor is finance yet focused as far as we need on addressing humanity's urgent sustainability challenges. Well, that's rules. What about ethics? Um, well, I've lost count of the number of times I've heard senior bankers talking about the need for bankers to act with integrity and behave in an ethical way to a degree where those words sometimes seem to have become vacated of meaning. And when words get vacated of meaning, they lose their power. Mention of ethics for many in financial markets is uh, likely to induce what some people call mego, my eyes glaze over. And that's partly because ethics is often thought of as a, a rather tedious list of do's and don'ts, uh, essentially an expectation that a group of people should conform with a set of rules that are the product of a dis someone else's descriptive exercise of right and wrong, rather than a way of being that grows from an understanding of essentially what makes for human well-being. Now, more of that later, I'm gonna come back to that. As the rule books and corporate codes of ethics have grown during my time at Freshfields, a question has been gnawing away at me. Long before the financial crisis, it was gnawing away at me. Does any of it bring about the sort of behavior change we really need? Now, clearly, that's about as existential as it gets for a lawyer. Um, and that's where my book comes in. Um, if rules aren't enough, what is? What alternative resources are available to us to help bring about this behaviour change? I think that the growing recognition of that financial markets function subject to a social licence has an important role. Uh, to play. So that's where we find ourselves and the issues that are, uh, are presenting themselves. Next question then is what is the social license? Just said that I think it can help. What is it? Well, the social license for financial markets is, if you like, an acknowledgement that the financial system relies on a deep 
social consensus in order to work. And because of that, there is a sense in which financial operators rely on a sort of social permission to carry on business. So think of it a little bit uh, as being like a medical license. In the United States, uh, a medical license gives certain people the freedom to carry out potentially dangerous medical work because it's in the interests of society. Society's license for financial markets is a bit like that. It gives individuals and firms the freedom to operate within financial markets because it's good for them, but also because it's in the interests of wider society. Now, finance firms actually are, of course, licensed to carry on business, and those licenses are given by regulators acting on behalf of society. So in that sense, there really is something that we can point to and call a social license. And furthermore, those licenses come with rules attached. And I'm certainly saying in the book that those regulatory licenses and some of those rules are part of the social license for financial markets. Now, just to digress for a moment, I don't suggest in the book that all financial regulation is part of a social license because I distinguish between behavioural rules and structural rules. Structural rules are like the rules uh, uh, under which companies are formed or markets are operated. Structural rules create a framework within which the license can be enjoyed, but I don't see them as being part of the license itself. But, but coming back to the, the substance of the social license, clearly talk of a social license for financial markets must be reaching beyond regulatory licenses and rules. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother to mention it. We would simply talk about needing uh, a need for finance to be carried on uh, in accordance with uh, firms' financial uh, financial licenses, their, their regulatory licenses and, and the regulatory regime. We're, but we're not doing that. We're talking about a social license for financial markets. So, so what are we, what, what we're clearly reaching beyond uh, the, the rule books. Critically then, I think, recognition that there's a social license is reaching beyond those things. In a sense, it seems to be making visible are wider aspirations for the overarching goal of finance. Logically, since, since we're talking about a social license, that aspiration must be social. It must be for finance to secure wider social goods. And one way of thinking about that, which establishes an important connection with law and regulation and indeed ethics, is that the aspiration concerns the role of finance in achieving just outcomes in which the overarching goal of human flourishing is advanced. Putting that in more technical language, or you may be thinking even more technical language, the social license um, can be seen as a freedom to pursue just ends by just means in financial markets where justice is a situation where human dignity of those in markets and those affected by their behaviour can be most fully experienced. Another way to see it is that recognising the presence of this social licence makes visible the systemic purpose of finance, which can then inform individual and corporate purpose. So, Saying that financial markets are subject to a social license is, I think, recognises something about the way financial markets actually are, the regulatory regime, the, 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 the tangible things that are there already and their, their relationship with wider society. But it also expresses an aspiration for how financial markets could be at their best, more fully orientated towards realising human goods not just generating money. But there's a problem with all of this. Currently, behaviour is often not aligned with those aspirations in practice, or at least people don't of, often don't think of it in that way. Instead, you often hear people talking about finance as if it's a, 
a kind of Hobbesian, non-stop, wolf of Wall Street, war of all against all, where the only goal is to make as much money as possible. Um, connecting perfectly, of course, with what I called earlier the shareholder value model of Milton Friedman. Many economists including, included have been debunking that myth for years. In reality, uh, people including in finance also display powerful displays to see justice done and to make a positive difference. But the narrative, the Wolf of Wall Street narrative, still has a powerful grip in practice. And that's important because the way we think and feel about the world affects how we behave. We're all affected by our environment. And if we're repeatedly told that finance staff are only interested in making as much money as possible, then it isn't too surprising if that's sometimes the result. So. That's an outline of what I think the social license is about. I mean, there's, there's a lot more in the book, obviously, but that's an outline. Um, but how does that connect with the challenges I described at the beginning? And how can greater recognition of a social license help us to bridge that reality gap between the Wolf of Wall Street narratives of finance and the wider, more other regarding aspirations that are also obviously there? Why can greater recognition of the social license help us? Well, if we're going to see behaviour change of the sort now needed, orientating uh, finance activity more fully uh, towards positive social outcomes, the way people feel and think about finance needs to change. To change behaviour, change hearts and minds. Now, the key thing about recognising that there's a social licence is it has the potential to do precisely that, and importantly to do so throughout the financial ecosystem because it talks to the whole of the financial ecosystem. Now, the ecosystemic dimension to all of this is important. Uh, with a complex system like the financial system, change has to be coordinated in some way across the system because all of the parts are interdependent. Rules still have their place, but we need to find a way of reaching into what really motivates people. Rules are reaching towards justice and we need to find a, 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 a way that engages hearts and minds that does the same. Now, throughout history, great leaders have resorted to powerful narratives to do that, often uh, echoing the way that I've just defined the social license, appealing to people's deeply held desire to see justice done. So take Abraham Lincoln and his Gettysburg Address, made at a time of deep social division to unite people around although he didn't use this expression at the time, the primacy of human dignity over, among other things, markets. And in that case, the markets were markets in cotton and human beings. Narratives like that work a little bit like the plot line in a movie. People get drawn into them and it can change the way they think, feel and behave. The social licence for financial markets has a narrative quality to it as well, and greater recognition that it's there has the potential to do something similar. Crucially, in doing so, it has the potential to displace the existing Wolf of Wall Street narratives that have been taking behaviour in the wrong direction, and to turn the finance ecosystem more fully towards realising human goods. How does that work? How, why? How can it do that? Well, essentially, when narratives like this engage hearts and minds, they do three things. They focus, they frame and they form. Now, thinking about those three things in the context of finance, they focus attention on some desires that people bring to finance over others some purposes that they have for finance over others, exercising and strengthening some desires more than others like muscles. Secondly, 
they frame the decisions that people take in pursuing those desires. If you think that the world is one way rather than another, it'll influence the decisions that you make about how you act. If you think that everyone around you is hell-bent on making as much money as, uh, as possible and little else, that will have a, a rather different effect on the decision you make than if you recognise that actually uh, people are motivated by a, a wider range of goals than that. So focus, framing, and then finally, over time, these behaviours form. They form the character of those involved and the culture of those institutions, creating individual and institutional predispositions to behave in one way rather than another. And that is really, really important. It's why people say that change in finance firms could take decades. Now, um, all three of those dynamics are also important to law and regulation because they influence what laws get made and the way that laws are complied with. So, for example, in the investment management sector, um, there's been a prolonged debate over whether investment portfolios or in those responsible for managing investment portfolios are legally required to do so in a way that is solely concerned with generating the most efficient risk adjusted financial return and excludes any consideration of environmental and social factors. Now, perhaps influenced by the sort of financial narratives that I mentioned just earlier, <coughs> excuse me, until 15 or 20 years ago, the answer to that question was yes. And it's only in recent years that the position has begun to change, even if just to allow that sustainability factors could be relevant to achieving a, a maximum financial return. But also, I think, in recognition of the fact that many, if not most investors, want their money to do good as well as earning a good return. <clears throat> but that uh, begins to stray into the, the uh, project that with the UN that uh, Rosa uh, mentioned earlier, and uh, we, we can perhaps come back to that in more detail on another day. So coming back then to where I started and uh, my, my little game, where's Milton? Legal and ethical rules are important. However, habitual behaviours, behavioural regularities of the sort that I've just mentioned, the sort that are formed over time, are the real rules of society, to use Friedman's words. A way of seeing the world, represented by the Wolf of Wall Street genre of narratives, has been forming our behaviours in a way that is not aligned with our overarching uh, aspirations for finance, which, going back to my earlier comments, um, include more other regarding aspirations. For behaviour to become more aligned with those other arching, uh, overarching, uh, other regarding aspirations, we need a different set of resources. We need to identify different accounts of what finance is really about. Not to make up accounts, but to identify accounts that are already there. To find them in the way that people are already to trying to describe the relationship between finance and society and our wider aspirations for the outcome that uh, financial markets should produce. That's why I started with Milton Friedman, because the recognition is already there, right in his quote. The quote that has been driving shareholder value for all of these years also recognises the presence of the social licence. So I see in discussion of the social license for financial markets, just such a narrative and just such a resource. And at this time with COVID-19 changing everything uh, from the way we live and work to the way we socialize, it seems to me that we have a real opportunity to recognize what it's telling us in a way that can make incremental but taken together significant changes throughout the financial ecosystem for the benefit of all. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy uh, indeed to uh, uh, discuss and uh, take questions.
Thank you very much, David. Thank you really uh, enjoyed it. I, I knew we would have enjoyed it. Uh, let me open the, the floor to discussion. Uh, if anyone has any question to ask David, you can either turn your camera on and ask it directly, or if you feel particularly shy or you have uh, connection issues, please feel free to post it in the chat. Um, thank you very much, David. That was a very, um, very inspiring talk. Um, my question would be, um, I mean, you're talking from from the sort of uh, perspective of finance and, and the social license and, and finance, um, but that I wonder to what extent that is sort of a second tier solution. Why don't we go to just a social license of, of business more generally? Because in the end, finance is sort of um, a means of doing business and a means of providing capital to business. And uh, I wonder what is the reason that we should just have a social license for that, um, just for finance or how would, how would you see that relationship? Is it a means to an end to make business more? Uh, and why don't we just go directly to the source, go to business directly? Okay, fantastic. Uh, a really good question. Um, it, the the book is about the social license for finance because I'm a, uh, a finance <laughs> lawyer uh, and that was my route in. But there is a, there is a more important uh, point because I think that the finance sector is, is an area where you can make the case most strongly. And the reason for that is because finance is largely a social construct. If you think about um, extractive industries, or even if you think about the manufacture of cars, they are all dealing with natural resources at one level or another. The raw materials of finance are things like shares, money, uh, bonds. These are all socially constructed. And for them to work, they rely ultimately on uh, human relationships, and human value, the value of work, uh, the value of trust and things like that. So uh, I think when you're looking at, you know, when I was saying earlier that the social license recognises that uh, finance depends on uh, a, a sort of a social consent or social permission in order to work. I think because it is so utterly dependent on these social constructs in order to do what it does, you can make the case uh, most strongly in the context of finance for that permission. It is most visible, if you like, in the finance sector. What I'm, I'm certainly not saying is that the, the, the social license, the concept of the social license is only relevant to finance. Um, and it, indeed, if I were to uh, be foolhardy enough to undertake trying to, to write a sequel, uh, The Social Licence 2, um, uh, I, that would be the direction that I'm going. And uh, indeed, um, uh, one or two people are, are already moving in that direction. And if you were living in Australia, you would be, uh, and uh, some, some of those who are, who, who are uh, zoomed in may well come from Australia. Um, there's a lot of talk in Australia over many years and indeed in Canada in the extractive sector about a thing called the social license to operate. Now, I, I don't see the social license to operate and the social license that I'm talking about as being quite the same thing. Um, I won't go into that. It's all in the book. Um, but it does certainly seem to me that um, there is a compelling case for saying that uh, business more widely uh, does indeed operate uh, subject to some sort of social license. So it's a great question. And uh, basically, I agree with you, but I, I, I thought I'd start with the financial markets and, and see where we got to. Thank you. David. May, may I just only uh, add to that? Um, and, and since we are uh, having a conversation based also on Hollywood movies, that probably also one of the reasons why it is so compelling to have it in finance is because finance operates with other people's money, which is basically our own money. So in a sense, because the, the money that, we, that is provided to the financial sectors comes also through our deposits, they need to have a, a just, as you were saying, uh, behavior. Thank yeah. you, David. <laughs>
Do we have any further questions? I think Saski has a question. Our student representative, Saski. Hi, hi, David. Thank you, Saski. Hi, Saski. Hi, hi. Um, Thank you for all of your organization. No, no, it, it's my pleasure, the least I could do. Thank you, uh, Professor Lastra and Costanza and Catrian for like um, giving me the opportunity to um, manage the logistics of this event. And thank you, David, for such a such an interesting talk. Um, what I wanted to ask is, you talk about change in behavior and change in outlook and in change in hearts. Uh, with this being such an individualistic approach to you know how one goes about certain things, I also wanted to bring in a small aspect in this about um, herd mentality in finance or any other sector for that matter. You're always looking at what the neighbor, what your neighbor is doing, or what the other person is doing, and then you generally follow what happens. So I, I'm sure that the same way. Uh, the same thing works in finance too. I mean, it's your money and you're generally cautious about where you want to put it and how you're getting it back. And if you're putting it to the right uh, right uh, places in getting your investment. But I feel um, the hurt, I mean, um, you look up to your bosses, you look up to your supervisors and your superiors and you see how that goes. And I feel if, um, if in the finance sector, if that could be regulated in some way, bring in um, bring in a more socially ethical herd mentality, if we can call it that. If you have any comments on that, yeah, uh, it's a it's a great question again. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I uh, completely agree about herd mentalities in finance. Um, John John Maynard Keynes very famously. Um, spoke about this uh, in the investment process um, uh, uh, in his sem seminal work uh, on capital. Um, at, but um, the, the, the point about the social license is that it addresses um, uh, both individuals, groups, firms, and the whole system. So it speaks to all of these levels. It, it, it speaks to what is going on in groups. And it recognises, I think, that what is going on in a group influences what uh, individual behaviours um, emerge. So when I was talking about framing, framing, the framing of decisions is essentially something that is driven by understandings within a group. So if the group is telling you, um, and th there are some wonderful ex experiments uh, uh, on this, as you, as you know, involving, you know, uh, um, groups of people who've all been pre-briefed, but one person in the room not knowing what, uh, not knowing everyone has been briefed, um, looking at the lengths of different bits of wood and so forth, and uh, the the entire group says that they're all the same length when manifestly they're not, and the the one individual who doesn't know anything about it um, uh, eventually agrees with the group and, and and says they're all the same same length, even though manifestly they're not. So. You know, this is a very, very powerful um, uh, uh, human dynamic. The, you do absolutely, therefore, need to address um, groups as well as individuals. And narratives do precisely that. They, they speak to all levels of a system. Um, now, you, you mentioned regulation. Where does regulation come into this? I think the important point about the social license is it's not f ultimately about regulation. It's what it, it's about what underpins regulation. It's what underpins ethics. But um, I do in the book, and I haven't spoken about it this evening. I do look at uh, ways in which regulation can help. And one of the uh, one of the areas I, I, I look at in the book is the use of regulation. Um, as a last resort, frankly, because I, I, I think the, you know, the, the whole point about this is it's aspiration driven, it's not something that's forced on people. But as a last resort, um, putting frameworks in place that encourage businesses to uh, do something called integrated reporting. Now, integrated reporting is designed to essentially combine financial values and wider values uh, in in one company account, if you like. And what it does is it forces companies to, um, it's a discipline. I mean, companies are doing this already. Lloyd's are doing it, HSBC. You know, it's very difficult, but they're, they're, they're working on it. 
and it forces them to look at the other values that are going on in the way that they run their business and to make those other values more visible. And if you if you do that properly, essentially what it, it does is it forces a company, all of the units within the company, all of the groups within that company to look at what they're doing and to look at non-financial values as well as financial values um, uh, as a measure of their success. And I think it's, it's mechanisms like that that can, uh, in, a, in a rather soft way, rather than sort of going to a group and saying, um, you know, we're, we're going to force you to, um, to recognise the social licence, rather than doing that, it, it, what it's, it's doing them is to provide them a, with a framework within which to discover or to, be, to make more visible the kind of values that I think the social license is drawing attention to. So, I mean, I, I completely agree with where you're coming from. I think the herd mentality is extremely powerful in finance. Um, and I think the social license uh, helps to address that. And I think regulation can have a role in that. Although I, I personally, I'm, I'm much more interested in the, the aspirational dimension to the social license, because I think we've had many, many years of uh, people trying to uh, essentially manipulate behaviour by using incentives. That's, I could say an awful lot more actually about herd mentality, but I'm going to stop there because uh, other people may want to ask questions. Yeah, I have a question. So uh, my, I'm actually going to write the question in the uh, message, but I'm going to read it. Uh, so um, centralised ethics implies centralised planning not necessarily by a public entity, like a state. Is centralized planning, even by purporting a common narrative, compatible with democracy, where it's usually, uh, and is it right to centrally plan socially engineer ethical issues in a pluralistic society? Like a centralized ethical goal, people would define ethics, justice, and social flourishing different. For example, in your talk, you criticize the freedom to want to make as much money as possible in this Wolf of Wall Street way, but it's actually a Republican virtue. It's like the belief in liberty and material self-sufficiency and an individual sovereignty. So, and also more, more substantively though, why would it be wrong if generating wealth for one person doesn't decrease wealth for everyone else, it actually increases it. So there's not actually a scarcity of resources in regards to wealth, like anyone can create wealth. Like me just talking right now has the potential to create wealth in a sense. So yeah. uh, the question is written down in the message, but- um, yeah. It's a, <laughs> I love the question. I love the question. And thank you. Uh, I do look at this in the book because I think it is an important issue. Um, you mentioned is, is this sort of centralised planning. I, I don't actually see this as centralised planning, but let, let me just use the expression since, since you, you've used it. Is this sort of centralised planning consistent with democracy? Well, you know, democracy is kind of centrally planned. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it does rely on social consensuses in order to work and of course if those social consensuses break down um democracy begins to fall apart itself and i think we're seeing a certain amount of that at the moment so we do need a certain level of consensus um but i you know i i take the force of your point i think uh, individual freedom is clearly important um, and indeed, freedom is essential to human dignity. And we could get into a, a, a really big debate about what that means. Um, I would distinguish myself between freedom from and freedom for. I think freedom from any sort of constraint uh, potentially takes us into uh, the sort of situation where um, uh, no one has any right to say that anything is wrong. Um, because everyone is free to do whatever they like and none of us can complain if someone uh, comes and exercises their freedom uh, to do something to us that we don't, we don't happen to like. Um, I think, though, where, where I would really... I, I think where I would focus my um, response to your question, and again, there's an awful lot we could say about this, but where I focus my response is on this concept of formation. Formation is going on the whole time, whether we like it or not. You know, um, if, if you had been uh, born and were growing up in 
1510 in this country, uh, you uh, would have had inevitably just had certain attitudes towards um, uh, uh, the opposite sex, towards the way that you dress, toward, you know, to, to everything, you, because you would have been formed by the environment in which you lived. You would have thought it was perfectly natural to go around hanging, drawing and quartering people. You might even have enjoyed going out to watch it um, because you were formed by that environment. That sort of formation is going on today. It, the, the formation, the, the, the processes that I was talking about, those, those Wolf of Wall Street narratives, they have formed us. Now, what I think the social license helps us to do is to recognise that those processes are going on. To, and, and to be much more explicit about, it, explicit about it and ask ourselves, well, how do we want to be formed? Do we just want to leave this to the default of the market, to this, uh, this process, supposedly, which is a, it's a complete fiction, but the, the fiction that uh, people are engaged in this war of all against all to make as much money as possible? Or do we want to be more conscious about it and to choose? And it seems to me that um, bringing this process of formation out into the open and looking at it actually increases our freedom because it's actually providing us with a choice that we don't happen to have at the moment because we, we aren't sufficiently aware of the formative processes that are coming to bear on us uh, as things are so can I, I see can I, can I ask a quick question though yeah, can, you instead, of, instead of instead of create doing like this whole brave new world social like re-social engineering society to capitalism why don't you just take a simpler approach and like because uh, I wasn't I was interning at Stanford for a bit and they had the same discussion but it was much more targeted towards capitalism instead of towards society so instead of changing society why don't you just change capitalism to instead of having a shareholder focused capitalism to have it towards a stakeholder focused capitalism. So essentially right now the legal system is built so that companies owe duties only to their shareholders. Why don't they just change the corporate structure so that they owe duty to their stakeholders, which includes the shareholders, but also broader parties. And that way you don't have to re-socially engineer the whole of society to make capitalism work. You can just change that small thing within the okay. capitalist system. I mean, I think that's a slight, slightly different question. I, I'm not really talking about re-engineering society. Uh, you kind of I'm, are, though. You're like, you're literally, let's re-socially engineer the whole of society to make, <laughs> like, let's let's create these social narratives where everyone's going to think differently, like this very brave new world, Aldous Huxley world, just so that capitalism will finally work. But if the capitalism rules are saying right now that the whole goal of capitalism is to maximize profits for, like, one shareholder, for example, right? And then the issue should be to just change that structure so that the goal of the company shouldn't be to maximize profits to one shareholder, but towards stakeholders. But you can actually write that in the Constitution. You can say that companies uh, have a duty legally not only to increase profits for shareholders, but also for broader stakeholders. And that would be a very simple solution where you don't have to re-engineer the whole of society. It yeah, was a conversation at Stanford that was happening. It's not my yeah. original idea. I, I think I think Daria, that that view of the world relies on the notion um, that if you make a rule, suddenly everything will conform to the rule, and it doesn't. The, the the point is that the rules that get made, and the way, more importantly, the rules that get followed, uh, depend on social narratives. Now, in the UK, it is not the law. In the UK, share, shareholder value is not the law in the UK. It is perfectly possible in the UK to do, for a company to do precisely what you want, what you're describing. But um, it, essentially uh, for that to happen, I think the social narratives that surround uh, companies need to change because they're being driven by the wrong sorts of narratives at the moment. Um, we probably ought to allow someone else to ask a question, I think. Yeah, we have time for one more question, and then I will make some concluding just remarks. So thank you. So one I think Courtney had a I think Courtney had a question in the in the chat uh, related to who is responsible for this. Uh, for example, uh, she gave the example of Hollywood. For example, you can sort of prevent them from making a Wolf of Wall Street too. Um, yeah. especially when it has Leonardo DiCaprio in it. I <laughs> cannot imagine people 
objecting to that. Um... Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's uh, it's all very entertaining stuff. Um, and I'd, one suggestion I do, in fact, make in the book is it would be wonderful to see uh, a a social license for financial market style movie. And, <laughs> you know, you do get them. You, I mean, not I've not seen one in the context of social license, but, you know, you, there, there are uh, on on um, uh, racial justice. There are uh, uh, movies that show um, significant moments of change that tell important stories. Um, I think there are probably important stories in finance that can be told as well, and they just don't get rehearsed. Um, so uh, whose responsibility is it? It's our responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. Um, it, it has to be. And it's not just the responsibility of those inside finance, because those outside finance have a responsibility as well. You know, um, the loans that went bad in uh, the States in particular, um, uh, in the run up to the financial crisis, those loans were taken out by people who lied. Um, they were encouraged to do so by financial issues, but they lied. So everyone has a responsibility here. But of course, I think the, uh, the, the epicenter of the problem uh, most people will feel is the finance sector and uh, the finance sector, if it wants to do something about it, is, is the place to start. Um, so I, th I think it is within the finance sector, but it, it's all of our responsibilities because it's a social license and it is about what is going on in our society. And I don't, I don't think, by the way, it is a, a government responsibility. I think it's really important that the social license is reaching beyond governments. It is, it is a common responsibility to get this to work. Thank you, David. Thank you. Just one final point on, on the previous discussion. Uh, I think that something that also might help framing the narrative or somehow uh, help addressing Daria's uh, legitimate concern it's also that we, I think we also need to start thinking at a different narrative related to the purpose of finance. Because we all think that the purpose of finance is to make money. And in this, if, if that was the case, I would understand all the points of liberalism and neoliberalism. But the reality is that we need to change that thinking. Because finance, as, the, uh, as David is, is saying, needs to, to serve just needs and, and uh, we, in, in need to have, it needs to have a just uh, end uh, in this sense. So I think part of this conversation is also for us to think what's the purpose of finance. But on this, I'll let Rosa concluding and I personally thank David for the, for the lecture. Thank you. Well, let me just say thank you very much to everyone that has contributed to making the evening a success. And first and foremost, David, this was really a wonderful presentation. And then, of course, my colleague, Costanza Russo, for her enthusiasm on anything that has to do with regulation, ethics and finance. And indeed, her last comment fits very well with them. In the introduction to our book, Bill Blair herself and me said that we have to reconnect the interest of bankers and financiers with the interest of society. And that broader purpose of finance, to which David was talking today, is really a challenge and an aspiration, but something that we cannot forget and we cannot neglect. My thanks also go to our wonderful student representative, Saski, who has made all the arrangements for this evening, to Katrien and also to our events team that have recorded events. So if some students ask you have not listened to this, you know, they can, of course, uh, listen to the recording. Let me just say, as I put in the chat, that you were talking today about, you know, Milton Friedman, you know, it's actually 50 years since he wrote that article, that famous piece in the New York Times. And today, coincidentally, Martin Wolf, and I just put it in the chat, has this... Uh, interesting piece. He's always an interesting economist that he writes in the Financial Times in which he says that Milton Friedman was wrong on the corporation and that the doctrine that has guided economists and businesses for 50 years needs a revaluation. And I pinpointed in the chat for those of you that want to continue with this, this debate, of course, please buy uh, David's book, The Social <laughs> License, but also you have this ebook in which there are a number of contributions by some distinguished economists as well as law professors, some in Chicago, in which they re-examine some of these broader considerations, not just about finance specifically, but the corporation in general, and the, 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 the interest of shareholders vis-a-vis -vis the interest of other stakeholders. So very timely debate. <laughs>
when I read EFT and when, when now you were talking about Milton Friedman, I think you know, it's, 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 it's a nice coincidence. But without further ado, let me again uh, allow me virtually, we live in Zoom land these days, to, to clap you know, for David and, and say thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. Yes. If and to you. Yeah. Bye, thank everyone. you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 Bye.